one day the tour guide said, I'm going to take it to something that's pretty unique. And so we got on the tour bus and we're driving through Berlin. And all of a sudden we turn and go down this, what looks like a German, typical German country road, except it was lined on both sides by the Berlin Wall. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. When the Cold War split Berlin in half between East and West, one neighbourhood was trapped in the middle and became a symbol of Cold War tensions. For more than 20 years, the hamlet of Steinstucken was caught in a tug of war between the Americans, the Soviets and the East Germans. Steinstucken officially belonged to the US occupation sector of Berlin, but it was located outside the city boundaries, completely surrounded by East German territory. No West Berlin-owned roads or trails connected it to the city. It was a de facto Western island in a communist sea. We speak with Cold War veteran Don Smith, the author of Steinstucken, A Little Pocket of Freedom, which is a photo and fact-packed book which describes the challenges America faced in occupied Berlin and the personal stories of the citizens of Steinstucken who faced East German soldiers on a daily basis. There's links to buy the book in the episode notes. Now, if you think there's a vast army of research assistants, audio engineers and producers putting together this podcast, you'd be wrong. This podcast relies on your support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available to everyone for free. If you'd like to help preserve Cold War history and enable me to continue to produce this podcast, you can via a one-off or monthly donation. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more details. You can also join our Facebook discussion group where the Cold War Conversation continues between episodes. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Now, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Don Smith to our Cold War Conversation. Well, I'm retired army officer and I was stationed in Germany from 1986 to 1989. So I guess you could say I'm one of the last cold warriors. I left Germany in September and then of 1989, then one month after the wall came down or opened up rather. And uh, stationed outside of Frankfurt and several times I took the opportunity to drive the, the highway from Helmstedt across East Germany into West Berlin, did that three times. And on one of those uh, visits, I went with a party into into West Berlin and we were touring some of the various Cold War spots. And so we had seen the wall from the distance. We'd actually gone up to the wall. And uh, so we we knew all what the wall was all about. We were a bunch of army lieutenants and our wives and girlfriends. And one day the tour guide said, I'm going to take it to something that's pretty unique. And so we got on the tour bus and we're driving through Berlin. And all of a sudden we turn and go down this, what looks like a German, typical German country road, except it was lined on both sides by the Berlin wall. So if you can imagine just having an an average German country road, the kind that you would see going between any typical two towns in Germany but on, on the left and the right side of the of the road, built up right next to it, were the walls and the watchtowers and the barbed wires and the road. And, and they followed the road all the way off into the distance. I, I'd never seen anything like it. And we went down the road about a kilometer and we ended up in this little neighborhood, just like the neighborhoods and German villages that we lived in when we were stationed in Germany. And that's when the uh, tour guide told us the story of Steinstucken. And I never forgot it because it. How can you forget? Not how can you ignore, uh, forget something like that? Such an extraordinary sight. And then fast forward to about 2014, I'd reached a point in my career where I'd always wanted to write a history book. I've uh, got a history degree, but I'd never worked in the history field, so I wanted to write a history book. And I looked around for a topic, and I realized that the story of Steinstucken had not been covered. <laughs> 
in the English language thoroughly. There is a very, very good book, matter of fact, an excellent book on Stein Stuggen written by uh, a professor named Honoré Catadal, C-A-T-U-D-A-L. Uh, it's called Stein Stuggen, a study in Cold World politics. And he spent time in Stein Stuggen, but it only covers up until the late 1960s. So uh, it, it doesn't cover much of the Cold War period. So I saw an opportunity to write a book, to take advantage of everything that's happened uh, s- since the wall came down, all the archives that have become available. And I found this wonderful wealth of information. I reached out to the Stein Stuken residents and they wanted to tell their stories because a lot of them are getting older. Many of them have passed away and they wanted their stories to be recorded. And so it was just a wonderful opportunity. So that's what led me to write the book. Brilliant. And that's exactly why I do the podcast is to capture these stories before they're lost. So it's great speaking to a uh, fellow historian who's who wants to you know, preserve the, mm-hmm. these Cold War stories. Now, we talked earlier about exclaves and Steinstucken was an exclave. There were other exclaves in Berlin or outside of the the main part of West Berlin as well. I think there was a one in the British sector called Ice Keller. Right. And that there were very smaller ones, but Steinstucken, I think, was the largest one, or certainly had the largest population. Yeah, it was the only one that was really considered to be settled by a community. There were about twelve people living in the Ice Keller uh, exclave, which technically was not an exclave because an exclave is an area of territory belonging to one country or one government organization that has no connection at all, legal connection at all to its parent country in this case. Uh, so there was no connection, no West Berlin territory that connected, for example, Steinstucken to the city of West Berlin. It was completely surrounded by territory that was part of the German state of Brandenburg, which was part of the Soviet zone. So there was no road that the U.S. Army or the, the uh, West Berlin police could legally drive down to get to Steinstucken. Ice Keller, there was one road. It was a dirt path uh, and it was very tenuous. But even the Soviets agreed that that path, if you were on it, you were on West Berlin territory. But that was still a flashpoint in a sense. Uh, I'd say it was the second most famous exclave uh, outside of Berlin. And I think uh, people that were uh, around during the the time of the Berlin Cold Cold War crisis might remember a picture of of a 12-year-old boy on a bicycle riding to school being trailed and guarded by a British armored personnel carrier. That was a resident of Ice Keller who told the British occupation authorities one day that the East German border guards had harassed him going to school. So the British occupation authorities decided to make a point of it. And for a few days, every day he rode to and from school, he was trailed by a British armored car. And that made so if y'all, if you, if you have people that are watching the podcast that remember that picture and that picture's in the book, by the way, that was, that was part of the British uh, enclave or exclave of Vice Keller. It, it is quite a famous picture of, of Cold War Berlin. I mean, I don't know whether you've heard, Don, I've heard that the boy had made up the story of being harassed by East German guards in order to avoid going to school. <laughs> Yeah, but he he did it at the time when the Berlin Wall crisis was going on. And something tells me that the British might have thought that he made it up, but it was an opportunity for them to make a strong public relations statement by having those pictures of the British armored car following the boy to and from school blasted around the world. So I don't doubt if the British were okay that he made up the story because he gave them a wonderful opportunity to make a statement. It did. It did. And a very iconic photo of uh, of Cold War Berlin. So back to Steinstucken, what was the, the square mile area and the actual population of the village? About 31 square acres. I would say it's, it's about the size of a typical English football stadium to count the stands and the parking lot area. That's a really good uh, image for me. And what was the population of Steinstucken? Less than 200 for most of the Cold War. Obviously, we we spoke about the road earlier. Now, the road only came into place later. And when East Germany was was formed or when the the Soviet zone was there, it was an actual island in East Germany because it was some distance away from uh, West Berlin. Right. About a kilometre. 
So how did Steinschucken exist then during that period? Were the, were the locals not allowed to get to West Berlin? No, they were. And Steinstucken, a good way to think of Steinstucken is, is it was like a bedroom community uh, of Berlin. Uh, it didn't have it didn't have a gas station. It didn't have a school. It had a convenience store is, is the biggest is the only business that was in it. So the people that lived in Steinstucken for years had walked or ridden their bicycles up this one woodland path is the best way to describe it. So they called the Waldweg or the forest way. And they never really thought about who it belonged to for all the years prior to the Cold War. And so what they would do is uh, anybody that had a job inevitably had it in West Berlin. So every morning they would take the woodland path, the Waldweg, into West Berlin and then come home at the end of the day. And that became an issue when the Cold War began because the way that the Allies divided up Berlin when they made plans for occupying it at the end of World War II what they did was they didn't take a map of Berlin, lay it on a table, and you didn't have the Soviets and the Americans and the British leaning over the map saying, okay, let's look for a north-south road. Okay, there's one. Let's divide the city in half that way. And now look for an east-west road. Okay, we'll divide the city that way. That creates four chunks. Okay, the Soviets, this is your pie. The Americans, this is your pie. British and French, this is your section. They didn't divide the city up that way. They actually came up with a relatively a good common sense way of dividing the city. There were Soviet, British and American planners in 1944 working in London on something called the European Advisory Commission. And they had been tasked by the foreign ministers of the U.S., U.K. and USSR to figure out a smart way to come up with plans for occupying Germany to include Berlin. So those staffers were working in London and somebody pointed out the fact said, you know, when you think about Berlin, don't think about it as one city. Think about it as 20 or more boroughs, kind of like Americans. When we think of New York City, you don't really think of one city. You think of the different bur- boroughs. You think of Manhattan, you think of Staten Island, you think of Brooklyn and the Bronx. And each of those boroughs has their own local government with their own local workforce. And so somebody said, you know, the Berlin is made up of 22 different boroughs. So instead of just drawing lines on the map, let's go ahead and allocate individual borough governments to each of the allied powers. So, okay, Russians, you'll get these six boroughs. Americans, you'll get these five boroughs. And that's the way that they divided up the city. And it turns out that the Americans got the borough in Berlin that was responsible for Steinstucken. So, when the Cold War began, you ended up with a situation where Steinstucken, which is officially part of the American occupation sector, was completely surrounded by Soviet zone territory. And if the American military or the West Berlin police had tried to drive from Berlin into Steinstucken, uh, it could have been a provocative incident. Uh, presumably, it's just a historical anomaly from way back when, the, the early years of Berlin. Uh, one of the things that I learned while researching the book is that Farms in West Germany or in Germany are a lot different than farms in the United States. Uh, when I when I think of a farm in the United States, I think of a huge contiguous piece of land, several hundred, maybe several thousand acres with a farmhouse and a barn in the middle. But that's not the case in, in much of Germany, where because farms have been divided and subdivided and sub- subdivided and, and parcels sold over the years, it's not uncommon for a German farmer to have 10 or 20 different plots of land that he has to drive to. Uh, And so, and so you have these fragmented farms out there. So it wasn't uncommon for farmers living in a village to have land in another area that was still legally, at least at, at that time in Germany, treated as part of the home village. So that's what happened several hundred years before the cold war in and around the area that became, uh, West area that became Berlin, there were a group of farmers in a little village and they started acquiring plots of land in an area about two kilometers south of where they were living. And as the centuries went on, those farmers acquired more plots of land in this area. They noticed that the land was rocky and wasn't the greatest soil, but it was the best they could find. And so they called it Steinstucken, German for for rock and stein and the German for pieces of stone. So Steinstucken, pieces of stone in, to commemorate the rocky soil. And 
Over the years, the farmers acquired more plots of land in the Steinstucken area. Some houses were built and a little village eventually grew up there. But for legal and tax purposes, it was still treated as part of the main village, which is about two or three miles away. Then as the centuries went on and Berlin started to grow and you had villages annex each other and merge with each other, you had lots of changes in the metropolitan makeup of that area. And then in 1920, when the Prussian state government passed something called the Greater Berlin Act, which created the city that we now know of as Berlin, you know, one of the largest, one of the greatest cities in Europe and of the world. When all was said and done in the Greater Berlin Act, the main village ended up inside the city of Berlin, but the Steinstucken area ended up outside by about a kilometer. And it was really just I wouldn't even necessarily say it was an oversight because nobody was really thinking about it. Nobody really thought it was that big a deal. They just continued to treat the people that lived in this small Steinstucken area as if they were Berlin members. They voted in Berlin elections. They went to Berlin schools. They paid Berlin taxes. Um, and prior to World War II, it just wasn't a big deal. But once the Cold War began, it became a very big deal for the reasons we've talked about. I understand that in 1951, the uh, East Germans decided that uh, they didn't want to have an exclave at Steinstucken. Toward the end of October 1951, the uh, GDR's border guards posted signs around the village saying that the village of Steinstucken was now officially being incorporated into the state of Brandenburg and was going to be attached to the city of Potsdam. And so that was an attempt by the East Germans to take the village over and incorporate it into the state of Brandenburg. How, how did the Americans react to that? Well, they were in a difficult situation because they couldn't, as I said, they couldn't drive there and nobody wanted to spark an international incident. And so there were some uh, intense discussions in the American occupation headquarters once this happened. And one of the arguments that was raised was that this is a village of less than 200 people. Uh, we physically cannot drive there. We can't, we can't protect it. The West Berlin police can't even go there. Wouldn't it be better just to take the people of Steinstuck and, and move them inside the city of West Berlin? Late 1951 was a time when Europe was still in massive turmoil. Millions of people had been uprooted from their homes in Eastern Europe. I think by then most of the refugees had gone home. But there were still lots of people in uh, Western Germany that had been pushed there from Eastern Germany and Eastern Europe. And so there was lots of social turmoil in uh, West Germany, and West Berlin at the time. And the argument sort of went that this is these are just less than 200 people. It's not worth the trouble. Uh, this is a place that if the Americans decide to protect it, then is something that could potentially start an incident. I mean, we if, we if you have a situation where American soldiers are shooting at Soviet soldiers, the situation can get out of hand very quickly. So there is a good practical argument for uh, giving the exclave over to over to, uh, over to the uh, Soviet zone. But there were counter arguments to that, and one of them was is that the West Berliners especially seemed to view Steinstucken as like a canary in the coal mine. And it's important to bear in mind that at this time, uh, in October of 1951, the occupation is winding down. West Germany has reinvigorated itself. Its, its economy has come back. The Wirtschaftswunder has uh, taken full hold, and West German uh, industry is, is doing well. And the United States has been involved in Korea for 18 months. And the United States is trying to uh, build up NATO, and it is specifically trying to get West Germany to agree to ally itself with the Western powers. So the Soviets, of course, didn't want that. And there's no indication that anybody, any appreciable size of, of, of a large number of people in either West Germany or West Berlin ever really wanted to join the Soviet Union. But there were a lot of West Germans and West Berliners that didn't want to get caught in a third world war. So the Soviets were putting out a lot of propaganda at this time, telling the West Germans and the West Berliners, if you ally yourself with the United States, if you if you join with NATO, if you provide uh, economic support to them, in other words, if you build defense products for the Western military uh, alliance, 
that's going to prevent us from allowing East and West Germany to come back together. And there was a very strong desire for reunification in Germany at that time, because a lot of people were still hoping that the separation of East and West Germany was a temporary thing. So the Soviets were providing it, applying an awful lot of pressure on the West Germans. And they were essentially saying, look, if you're not going to join us, that's fine, but don't join the United States. Just stay neutral. Don't provide soldiers to the NATO militaries. Don't provide uh, finished products and other economic production to support. Just stay neutral. And the Americans, though, we really needed the West Germans to partner with us because we needed the strength of West Germany to support the uh, the growing uh, Western European community and the NATO community. So the problem that that created for the United States was is that we needed the West Germans to trust us. We needed them to have faith in us. And there was a uh, good CIA report on the exclaves of West Berlin put out in 1967. And it said that the exclaves are strategically insignificant. However, they're primarily important as a test of Western resolve. So what the American uh, command in Berlin was concerned was, is that if the Americans had let Steinstucken go, even though there are lots of practical reasons for it, there could have been a very strong public relations backlash in West Berlin uh, and in West Germany. And that might have complicated American efforts to get West Germany to agree to ally itself going long term with the Western side in the Cold War. And at first, I thought some of these concerns were overstated, but I've gone back and I've read some of the uh, reports that were coming out of West Berlin at the time that Steinstucken uh, was taken. And the West Berliners took it very seriously. They have literally viewed this as a canary in the coal mine, a test of the United States' ability to stand by its promises and as to be as the guarantors of West Berlin. So those were the challenges that the Americans were facing when Steinstucken was taken. Strategically, it was insignificant. There was nothing there that was worth uh, shedding one American life over as, as far as the Americans were concerned. But it was a big PR problem. But the, the Americans managed to get the East Germans withdrawn from Steinstucken after that incident in 51. And what they did was they they held their ground. The uh, American commandant, Major General Lemuel Mathewson, went out to all the press uh, or outlets and said, this will not stand. I insist that the Russians leave and we're, we're not going we're not going to allow them to keep Steinstucken. This is essentially what he said. Now, if he had decided that he was going to let Steinstucken go, he probably would have used modern language in that. But instead, he went out and he basically planted the flag of the United States figuratively in Steinstucken in the minds of the press. And from what I've been able to tell, and again, I, when I wrote this book, I didn't have access to any East German or Soviet archives, so I don't know what they were saying at their on, on their side. But right after Matthewson came out and said that he was not going to give up on Steinstucken, the Soviets came and they asked for a parley. And so then Matthewson and the senior American the diplomat in Berlin, a gentleman named Cecil Lyon, they met with the Soviets and the Soviets tried making the claim that Steinstucken really belonged to them and Matthewson would have, have, have none of it. And the Soviets backed down. They didn't push, they apparently did, based on the records, they did not push the issue very hard. Uh, a CIA report later said it seemed it, it seemed that the Soviets were trying to blame the East Germans for overreacting uh, by taking the, the exclave. Personally, I don't think East Germans would have taken the exclave without the Soviets' approval. Uh, from my reading of the situation, it appears that the Soviets decided to give it a try to see if the Americans would just let the exclave go. And once the Americans made it very clear they were going to hold on to the exclave, the Soviets backed off. I guess it was a, a good trial run because the well i'm thinking back to that period and obviously there was the berlin airlift in 1948 mm -hmm. where the soviets had tried to strangle west berlin into being absorbed within east germany in the soviet zone and this was possibly another attempt to just test the water and and just see whether it was almost like um the salami slicing approach right and, just try and nibble at bits around the edges and then see how far we get. And that's the metaphor that you see used a lot in the in the, in the reports that are written of the time is that the, uh, Lenin supposedly said, uh, advance with a bayonet. If you encounter mush, keep going. If you encounter steel, pause. And so the Americans decided to show some steel. And I would like to say one other thing that 
that, that sometimes gets lost in the historical record is that there were practical reasons for the Americans sticking up for Steinstucken. But as you read the record, you will see there were some State Department employees there that felt very seriously that the Americans had a moral obligation to protect the village because they had said they would. They, they had come out and said that they would protect all of the areas that were part of the American occupation sector. And so there were State Department employees that were involved in these discussions said, saying that essentially words have meaning. We've said that we would protect a part of the American occupation sector. Steinstucken is clearly part of the American occupation sector. Yes, it's a very inconvenient part, but people are not going to believe us if we say one thing and do another. And I, to be honest, I think the uh, I think there were it was the practical argument that won out for Matthewson. He didn't want a, a PR disaster. But I think it's important to point out it, it, sometimes nowadays we tend to look at history and look at only the cynical parts of it. But there were some people in the American occupation uh, authorities that were that were trying to do the right thing. And I think they and that's one of the reasons that I mentioned them in the book is that they were standing up and saying that, look, we we we're said we're here supporting a principle. Well, are we or aren't we? I think that the mayor of West Berlin was very vocal yes. about not letting Steinstucken being a, to be absorbed. And and that's one of the things I've been grateful about this book is that I've had a chance to go back and hopefully reintroduce or introduce more modern day history readers to uh, figures that were very well known just 30 or 40 years ago. And one of them was the mayor of West Berlin, a gentleman named Ernst Ruder. And if you read the uh, reports and the memoirs of the State Department employees that were in Berlin during the Berlin airlift in the years immediately after that, they speak almost with reverence of Ernst Ruder. He was he was a former communist who grew disillusioned with the party, and then he was expelled from Germany by the Nazis in the mid-1930s. He was in Turkey during the war, and then he came back. And he jo- came back to Berlin and he joined the SPD, the Social uh, the Social Democratic Party, which was the primary uh, Western leading political party in Berlin. And he rose to the leadership of that party and then was eventually elected as mayor. And uh, he was a, a towering public symbol and uh, and had. I wouldn't say all the complete face of all West Berliners, because that's not possible for any human to have. But uh, he was a widely revered and widely respected figure. And Reuter used his public relations power for Steinstucken. He came out very early and said, this is a test for the Americans, Steinstucken. And so he was not some little uh, borough mayor that could be uh, ignored. He was one of the more popular figures in the free world during the time. And when he came out and said the Americans need to protect this village, uh, that really increased the weight on the American shoulders. Um, so if if people learn a little bit more about Ernst Ruder and how important he was to the cause of freedom and the Western cause in Berlin, that that's a, that's a great side effect from the book. He's a massive figure in that early Cold War period in Berlin. And, that, you know, we spoke of iconic Berlin photos of the ice keller a uh, young boy being escorted by the British armoured car. But there's another one, which is a huge crowd on the open ground outside the Reichstag. And he's standing there like this, and he looks out into the crowd. He says, people of America, people of England, people of Italy, look to this city, shout auf diese Stadt. And he, and he held up his hands at that time, and it was just a titanic moment. And the fact that he was standing in front of hundreds of thousands of people outside the Reichstag who were... Um, mesmerized by what he was saying, to include a lot of people in the occupation authorities, too. There were lots of American occupation officials there who were just blown away. They came to the speech. They were blown away by uh, Reuter's power. Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, I, I tried to get a picture of that, that scene with him holding up his hands like this, but I just couldn't find any that were readily available. So I, I have a good picture from the American, uh, American occupation authorities, but uh, uh, one of the things I would like to see is a good English language biography of Ernst Ruder. I've not found one. I've looked. There are several in German, of course, but I think that would go a long way. That's a really good question. Yeah. Hopefully one of the many historians that listen to this podcast will think, actually, yeah, that's a really good idea. That that would be invaluable. A, so, that, so that people in America and England who'd forgotten who Ruder was uh, could learn about him. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a great idea. Now, you know, we're talking about a period of Berlin of West West Berlin when the borders with East Germany and East Berlin were relatively porous in terms of there was a, a reasonable free flow of people who could certainly access West Berlin from East Berlin. But then in 1961, the Berlin Wall is built, which seals off West Berlin from East Germany and East Berlin. Mm -hmm. What happens to Steinstucken in that period? Well, in early September, the, the, the Berlin Wall went up on August 13th, early September, there were some concerns that the uh, that the East Germans were going to try to take over uh, the exclave. Matter of fact, they started putting up they, they put barbed wire fences around Steinstucken at this point, and they had done that from time to time in the 1950s, uh, basically to apply a little heat to the village. But then they they had always removed them. But these these were these barbed wire fences. They stood up, and they were they eventually got replaced by the Berlin Wall. So this is the first time that Steinstucken was actually sealed off from easy access from East Germany. And one thing I want to point out is that when we're trying to assess the level of risk that Steinstuckeners had because of their allegiance to the West throughout the 1950s. A Soviet or an East German official could simply have walked into Steinstucken, grabbed somebody, and dragged them away. There were no fences, no walls, uh, and the Americans and the West Berlin authorities were so far away that by the time they'd heard that somebody had been taken, uh, it would have been too late to do anything about it. They'd have been long gone. And yet the people in Steinstucken, I mean, they didn't deliberately set out to provoke the East Germans. They, uh, but they, they stood up against them time and time again. When the East Germans, for example, told them they wanted the, the residents to get East German identity cards, they would refuse. And they had to know that somebody could have just walked up to their house at one night and taken them away. When the Berlin Wall went up, that, that fear went up exponentially because obviously the stakes had been risen now. The Soviets and the East Germans had risen the stakes and the people in Steinstucken felt very vulnerable. So fortunately for them, President Kennedy uh, designated retired General Lucius Clay to be his personal ambassador to Berlin to work through the crisis. And the Berliners loved Clay because he was the hero of the Berlin airlift, Der Vater der Luftbrücke. And so they, there, was tr there was a tumultuous crowd when he came back in mid-September to, uh, to Berlin and he got his feet on the ground. He started the very first day he was there. He started looking around. He started asking people about the situation in the city. And somebody happened to mention the exclave of Steinstucken. So what Clay did was he flew to Steinstucken. He initially tried to drive there and he was stopped by the East German police. So fortunately, uh, an unintended consequence of the planning in Berlin amongst the Americans, British, and the Russians immediately after the end of World War II created an opportunity for Clay to fly to Steinstucken. So let's go ahead and go back to 1945. The Americans, British, and Russians have now settled into the city. And in the Berlin Air Safety Center, they're controlling all these flights coming in. And the Americans and the British and the, the Americans and the British and the Russians are getting to know each other. The French haven't arrived yet. And and so these are air traffic controllers. They all speak different languages, but they understand the problems of air traffic control. And they said, listen, we've got all these planes coming in from different parts of Europe. And every so often, because the weather's bad, they've got to loiter while we're waiting for them to be able to come into one of the airfields here, uh, whether it be a Russian or a British or an American airfield. Well, we need to have some area where these planes can loiter around Berlin, regardless of whether they're British, French or American planes. So they came up with something called the Berlin Control Zone. And what they did was they, from the Berlin Air Safety Center, they measured out 20 miles, created a radius of 20 miles. And they said, from the Berlin Air Safety Center, going out 20 miles, that, that the circle that's created from that, aircraft can fly below 1,000 feet anywhere within that area, regardless of what country they're from. Fortunately for the Americans, that 20-kilometer radius covered Steinstucken. 
So that enabled General Clay to use U.S. Army helicopters to fly out to Steinstucken without having to get approval of the Soviets. So that's what he did. He didn't announce that he was going. And so you have the residents of Steinstucken, they're out tending their gardens, and all of a sudden they hear helicopter blades, and they look up. This American helicopter sets down, and General Clay steps out in his business suit, and everybody recognized him. And it created this, uh, of course, this, this, the residents of Steinstucken were overjoyed to see him there. And Clay told all of them that the Americans meant it when they said that they would protect West Berlin. And I think the reason that Clay went out there was he recognized that Steinstucken was probably the most vulnerable part of West Berlin because there was no road to it. So if you go out and you say, I'm willing to protect this part of West Berlin, that by de facto means you're going to protect the whole area and that all of West Berlin. And that provided a great reassurance to the people of West Berlin that the Americans were demonstrating their resolve to protect West Berlin and protect Steinstucken because Clay set himself up in a situation that if the Soviets had then moved into Steinstucken, he'd have been embarrassed. He'd have been humiliated. Uh, what's so one of the things, the observations I made in the book was that prior to the Stein, Clay flying out to Steinstucken, this was September 22nd, 1961. Prior to Clay flying to Steinstucken, the Americans, British and French had been in react mode during the Berlin Wall crisis. They were always having to react to what the Soviets and the East Germans were doing. So this was one small way for Clay to take the initiative back. It forced the Soviets and the East Germans to react to him. And so the East Germans started making all of these public declarations about how the Americans had done a provocative thing by flying over sovereign East German airspace. And it gave the Americans the perfect opportunity to go back and say, as far as we're concerned, there is no such thing as sovereign East German airspace because there is no sovereign Germany, East Germany, as far as we're concerned. Uh, And so it was an opportunity for us to push back a little bit. It was an opportunity for Clay to demonstrate American resolve. But Clay also recognized that that might not be enough, him just flying out there once. So then what he did was he had Berlin Brigade send out an MP detachment, military police, only about three or four at a time. And what they did was they patrolled the exclave. And Berlin Brigade maintained that detachment for 11 years, from 1961 to 1972, when the road was finally built as part of the Quadripartite Agreement. Uh, And they maintained it by flying MPs out in helicopter. And for the first few years after the Berlin Wall crisis began, before the exclave of Steinstück was actually surrounded with the big, thick slab panels that we now think of when we think of the Berlin Wall. Because for several years, the Steinstucken was only surrounded by a barbed wire fence, which you could get through if you wanted to. There were a fair number of refugees that came into Steinstucken from East Germany, and the Americans would fly them out in the helicopters too. So prior to this point, there wasn't a U.S. presence in Steinstucken. They were relying on the goodwill of the, the East Germans and the Soviets that they wouldn't enter it. Well, yeah, I I guess to some point, or they just, uh, I think the Americans knew that they put themselves out there, that they would potentially be vulnerable, that uh, the three MPs could easily have been overtaken. Uh, After the Berlin Wall crisis, though, the Americans decided they were willing to run that risk. Actually, Clay was willing to run that risk. He didn't get that. From what I can tell, he didn't clear that with anybody. He just used his authority as the, as President Kennedy's representative to have the MPs go out there or t- or tell Berlin Brigade they needed to provide a presence out there. And uh, Berlin Brigade, when Clay left about nine months later, uh, they didn't pull them back. Matter of fact, they stayed there for over a decade. From what I understand from your, your book, about 20 border guards defected via Steinstück. Th- well. that, that's what I've been able to count. I think there might have been a lot more than that. It was not uncommon to have an East German border guard walk in with his weapons and surrender. And so if you, you talk to the MPs there, they say what well, didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough that they weren't completely freaked out when it happened. It was, I wouldn't say it's a relatively common occurrence, but it certainly wasn't uncommon. Yeah. Cause you have a great story of uh, them having a, like a surplus supply of us army uniforms. Right. Yeah. What would happen is the, the, the refugees would come in and, they decided that they didn't want they didn't want to make it easy for the East Germans to be able to identify the refugees who were getting on the helicopter. 
So what they would do is they would, if they had long hair, they would cut their hair and then they would dress them up in U.S. Army uniforms that they had, or at the very least, they put on U.S. Army ponchos, the green overall ponchos, and have them wear those. And then they would wear those when they got into the helicopter because the helipad in Steinstucken, the the East German border guards could see into it. So they could see the people who were getting on there. So they had to camouflage them somehow. But they did, and that's, and that's what they did. They would cut their hair, put them in ponchos, put a hat on them, and fly them into West Berlin, and then they would leave just like any refugee. It's great. I mean, it, it's it's almost like a mini Berlin airlift during mm-hmm. that period, isn't it? In terms of yeah, for a first year, for, I think I like for the first year or two, but then after that, the uh, they brought in the they br- they, they brought in the more uh, the East Germans uh, fortified the wall, and they also in, instilled more discipline along the uh, uh, the per- Steinstück perimeter, make it harder for people to escape in. But it still happened going on into the sixties every so often. And could the villagers still get to West Berlin without a helicopter ride during the, this period? The villagers would walk or drive over the Waldweg. And every so often the in the 50s and the 60s, the the GDR would close the Waldweg or they would insist that the, the villagers got East German border passes. The Americans always pressured the, the villagers not to get East German border passes because – they were concerned. Remember, the American policy was that there was no such thing as an East Germany. There was no East German government. Well, if the American occupation authority recognizes East German border passes, that then gives the Soviets grounds to argue, OK, now you've recognized East Germany. So they would go to insane lengths to not recognize, to not to be appear to be recognized in the East German. So and the Steinstuckers went along with that. And that's one thing that that I noticed, I, I said to myself, if I'd been a Steinstuckerner, I might have said to the American occupation authorities, listen, I'm going to support you in most cases, but it's just a piece of plastic. I'm going to get this piece of plastic so the guards don't hassle me. But the Steinstuckerners resisted doing that. And th- the most common harassment that you saw in the 50s and the 60s was preventing West Berlin commercial and public services from going into the exclave. They never allowed the West Berlin police to go in. They generally allowed the West Berlin fire brigade to go in, but lots of times they wouldn't allow the coal, uh, the, the coal companies to deliver coal or furniture deliveries to be made. And, and they were always changing the requirements for that because every so often the, the, the GDR would say, okay, every businessman that comes to Steinstucken needs a GDR pass, West German businessman. Then they would say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll relent. And if you put your name on a list, if you're on the list, you can come into the village. And then two years later, they say, okay, we're going to go back to the passes again. Okay, we're going to reinstitute the list again, but only for the priest and the doctor, not for the coal companies, that kind of thing. And this, the American State Department was constantly having had these arguments with uh, the, the Soviet occupation authorities, because remember, the Americans wouldn't deal with the East Germans. If there was a problem and the Americans had to get involved, the Americans went to the Soviets and then the Soviets went down and talked to the East Germans. And from what I could tell, the Soviets for the most – I got the impression that the Soviets and did not want Steinstucken to become a painful issue. They almost preferred that it just be something that nobody nobody noticed, that nobody really – we didn't call – they didn't call attention to it. Uh, and – so in many cases, they came down on the side of the Americans when there was a dispute with the East Germans, and they would force the East Germans to cut back on their restrictions. But it was constantly a back and forth thing. Yeah. I bet the East Germans love that with the Soviets, um, you know, big big brother telling them what to do. I, I got uh, I've heard stories about how the Soviets like to like to uh, abuse the East Germans and belittle them, and I'm sure they took some opportunities to do that here. But an important thing to bear in mind is that. What I thought was an extraordinary thing was that for the most part, the people of Steinstucken, through all of this, managed to live relatively normal lives. I mean, they were obviously nervous and concerned, but not nervous and concerned enough that they moved out of the village. They felt comfortable enough with the American support, and they also felt comfortable enough that the Soviets didn't want to make an issue of the village, that they were able to to rationalize staying in the village. And matter of fact, toward the... uh, late part of the 1960s, there were even people in West Berlin who were trying to buy houses in Steinstucken 
because the word had gotten out that Steinstucken was a very quiet place. And one of the American soldiers who, who was there said it was deathly quiet. You couldn't hear any car traffic or all the sounds that you normally expect in a city. Well, if you lived in a major city like London or New York, there's sound all the time. Steinstucken was a place where you could have your house in a very quiet area, like being out in the, far, in the, far, in the farmlands in, in the countryside, and then take a very short trip pick up the bus and you're in the middle of your major of the major city. I've seen a video on YouTube after the road was built, giving the direct connection. And it's an interview with one of the villagers who's delighted that the land value has gone up massively because it's now easy access, but still a really peaceful location. One of the, uh, one of the villagers was interviewed by a Western newspaper back before the, the Berlin Wall and was asked, what's it like living in Steinstück? And he said, well, there's some benefits. For example, the West Berlin tax collector never gets out here. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. Now, we, we talked about the road, the connection, the direct connection to Steinstück and the road that was built. Mm -hmm. How on earth was that allowed? How did that come about, that, that direct road that was built? Because of the Quadripartite Agreement, otherwise known as the Four Power Agreement, and this is the 50th anniversary of the Four Power Agreement going into effect. And the Four Power Agreement was one of the major accomplishments of detente. And in the early 1970s, President Nixon the, and the Soviets and Lots of people in Western Europe, they wanted to try to lessen tensions in the European continent. And so one of the things the Americans and the British said that if you really want to lessen tensions in the Amer on, on the European continent, let's come to some arrangement with Berlin. And the problems they were having with Berlin was from the West, from the West German and the Western powers side, there was no formal guarantee of access by road, rail or water from West Germany into West Berlin. There was a formal agreement for the air quarters that were used for the Berlin airlift, and the Soviets honored that agreement. But there had been no formal agreement from the Soviets to the West, what, were, what had been the Western powers, saying that there will be uninterrupted road, river, and rail travel from West Germany to West, to West Berlin. And if you don't have that, you can't have a viable West Berlin economy and society. And so the East Germans had been able to close that off, that, that act, those accesses off whenever they felt like it. Uh, it created a lot of uncertainty in economic planning. I mean, if you're a businessman, do you want to build a business in Berlin with the expectation that your raw material is going to come in from uh, West Germany by rail and your finished products go back out by rail? And once you've set up your plant and you've got all your workers and you've gone, you've started production, all of a sudden the East Germans close all that down. That was a real fear. And so the Western powers wanted some assurance that there would be uninterrupted civilian traffic. They weren't too concerned about military traffic because they knew that, that if the Soviets cut off, mil allowed military traffic to be cut off, that could be a flashpoint. And so they, they were pretty confident that the Soviets were going to not affect the rights of the Americans, British, and the French to go to Berlin. But if you wanted Berlin to be a vibrant uh, city culturally and economically, you needed connections for West Berliners and West Germans in, uh, in the early 1970s those guarantees didn't exist. So that's one thing they wanted from the four power agreement. And then the second thing that the West Germans and West Berliners especially wanted was the ability to go and visit their family members in East Berlin and East Germany. I'm sure we've all seen the pictures or the newsreels of families in West and East Berlin. You have half the family on one side of the wall in West Berlin, the other half the family on this side, East Berlin, and they're holding up children that the people on the other side have never seen mm -hmm. because there, there have been births that the family that the family members on the other side of the wall couldn't couldn't celebrate, um, and really, Brandt, re the mayor of West Berlin, the, the chancellor of Germany at the time, really wanted to start bringing uh, reinvigorating the ties between West and East, East Germany. This was a, one of the central themes of Ostpolitik. Um, so, the Americans said these are the things we want to. America's British said these are the things we want to accomplish with a with a deal for Berlin, and the Soviets agreed. So there were some long negotiations, 
But in September of 1971, they signed the Quadripartite Agreement that in the Quadripartite Agreement, the Russians essentially guaranteed that road, river and uh, rail traffic between West Germany and West Berlin for civilians would not be hindered. And that was a huge that, that was a huge concession from them. The Americans, British and the French also agreed that they would pressure the West German government to not try to incorporate West Berlin into the West German government, not make it a land, so to speak, of West Germany. That was one of the things that the, the Soviets had always been concerned about. So West Berlin was still this freestanding political entity out there. And then the other parts of the uh, four, four power agreement were that there was going to be improved uh, communication connection and economic connections between East Germany and West Germany, where the two, that the two countries would actually negotiate themselves together. So the four powers were going to get involved in that. It was going to be East Germany talking to West Germany. And for those of you that remember Conrad Adenauer, who was the chancellor of West Germany uh, when, the, when the country was first, FRG was first created, his policy was not to deal diplomatically with the East Germans at all. Well, Ostpolitik ended that and the, and the Quadripartite Agreement ended that. So the East Germans, and the West Germans got together to work out a whole bunch of arrangements to include people traveling back and forth and improvements in telecommunications and post. And as part of those East and West German discussions, they said that border issues to include the issue of Steinstücken can be worked out with an exchange of territory. So what these Germans did is they took a strip of land just wide enough for a road that connected Steinstücken to Berlin, sold that to West Berlin, and then West Berlin used that to build a road to Steinstücken that opened up in August of 1971. Once they had that road, everybody agreed that that road belonged to West Berlin and Steinstücken was no longer an exclave. The American military could get there. The West Berlin police could get there. Tourists could get there. Uh, and that ended Steinstücken's status as an exclave. Was there a reciprocal exchange of territory from West Berlin? I think some of the smaller exclaves were exchanged. These were, for the most part, and I'm just going through memories here, but these weren't inhabited exclaves. They were fields, for the most part. And there were some farmers in West Berlin and some farmers in Steinstücken that for decades had been farming fields in East Germany. And so they would get on their tractors, drive to the, Ameri to the American checkpoints, drive through the East the GDR checkpoints, drive out to their field, farm it, and then come back. And a bunch of those fields were transferred over uh, to East Germany. Uh, but I thought the biggest thing, the biggest transfer was money. Uh, basically, the West Germans, uh, the West Berliners bought the land. Now, I'm sure that there would have been various incidents around Steinstück. And indeed, I think you cover some of them in, in your book. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a story in there of two boys who were playing soccer who uh, had a little bit of a tussle with the East German border right. guards. Can we talk about that? Yeah, what, what happened is they were playing soccer and they kicked the ball too far and it went into an adjacent field. And so they went over to the field to get the ball and an East German border guard came over and said, uh, what are you doing here? You're in East Germany. And the boys said, well, this is a better soccer field than the one in our village. And that didn't go over well with the GDR border guard. So they took him away. And one of the boys was old enough that they, I wouldn't say they tried to indoctrinate him, but they started asking political questions to see if maybe he could be brought over to the East German side. Uh, and apparently they didn't go very well. Apparently he was mostly interested in soccer uh, or football, as you'd say. And so they eventually released them. Uh, the uh, The most common incidents that would happen with the residents would be when they were stopped going to and from West Berlin on the Waldweg. Maybe the GDR border guards would stop them. And there was one incident that uh, I mentioned in there. Uh, there was a lady named Margaret Wies. Her she she married she was a Steinstücken resident. Ended up marrying an American MP. So she's also listed in the book as Margaret Sanchez. And when she was in her early teens, she was walking back from West from school in West Berlin one day and the GDR border guard stopped her and they took her into the uh, guard shack and they showed her a picture of an American helicopter that had landed in Steinstücken and the picture was in a West Berlin newspaper. And they said, do you know who took the, to the, took the picture? 
And she said, well, I have no idea who took the picture. And they said, come on now. There's not that many people in Steinstuck and you must know who took the picture. And she said, I don't know. There were a lot of people in Steinstuck and with cameras that day. I don't know who took the picture. And so, and then apparently they asked her one, one or two more times to the point that her father actually had to go to the GDR border guards and say, um, could you leave the kids alone? You know, if you want to talk to somebody, talk to the parents, but leave the kids alone. There was this one, there's this one, uh, anecdote that a, another uh, gr- girl who grew up in Steinstuck and told, uh, she said that the parents figured out that uh, some of the border guards were nice people. And there was a GDR border station right outside of Steinstuck and, and it had this traffic pole the, with the red and white striped pole on it that you that the border guard would lift for you to pass through. And normally he would let anybody coming out of Steinstuck and go because in most cases, the border guards knew who lived in Steinstuck. And, and so if some of the kids wanted to ride to West Berlin, they'd let him do that. And this, this uh, girl who's now a grown woman said that some of the parents, what they would do is they would go up to the border guards and tell them which kids either were too young to leave the exclave or maybe they were being punished and were told they couldn't go into Berlin and so when the kids rode up to the to the, the the pole and hoped to go into the village, the GDR wouldn't lift the, the pole for them. And I, I just I got a I still get a kick out of that story. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. And it's also an example of when we think about the Cold War, we tend to think about presidents and prime ministers and generals and admirals. But this is a case where the Cold War was literally fought out at the individual level where you have a village of people that are trying to live normal lives, but they're completely surrounded by the Cold War. And in many cases, the people who were uh, on the ground, the Steinstokeners and the GDR border guards, they learned how to work things out. They learned how to diffuse things. And uh, one example of that was uh, in Steinstoken, they had a, a, one of the residents was hired by this, by the, uh, the borough of Zeilendor, which is the Berlin borough that Steinstucken was part of, to be the administrative representative there. He's unofficially known as the mayor. So anytime anybody had to deal with the West Berlin government or with the American authorities or with the East Germans, it would be the mayor, the administrative representative. So there was an election going on in East Germany. And one day the mayor in his car drives to the border control point and then he drives into West Berlin and he's driving to West Berlin. He notices people are giving him some funny looks and some really hard looks. And he's like, what have I done? Have I not dressed well or something? And then somebody came up and asked him why he was supporting the East Germans. And turns out one of the East German border guards had put like an SED bumper sticker on his car while they were checking it. <laughs> and so he goes back and he complains. And the East German border captain's like, I'm sorry. I've got some young people here. I guess they thought you heard the, you heard the old phrase, uh, uh, a for initiative F for judgment. Okay. They probably thought it was a good idea, but I, I apologize. This won't happen again. And, uh, the, uh, the borough of Zalendorf kept a lot of records from the administrative representative. And so some Steinstuck and rep, uh, residents found the records, translated them, and put them in, and so I was able to put them in the book. And you'll see that in many cases, there, I mean, there were def- definitely periods of tension, but in many cases, the locals worked things out at the local level because everybody just wanted to cooperate and get along. And I, and I think you're right. I mean, that, that's a really good analogy of Steinstuck and of the, the Cold War was right in front of them. One of the things that I, I learned in the book is that. I saw time and time again that if there was an agreement that the Allies had made with the Russians on paper, if there was a formal agreement, the Russians kept it. Now, if obviously the Russians took advantages to slice salami as much as they could, but if there was a formal agreement, they generally kept it. And so the impression of the American occupation authorities in October 1951, when the Soviets first raised the issue of Steinstucken, was that the Soviets accepted the fact that the Americans had never given Steinstucken over to the Russians. So based on the European Advisory Committee uh, plans for how Berlin was to be divided up, Steinstucken did belong to the Americans and the Russians accepted that. And also, I think we saw several times during the Berlin Wall crisis where the, 
the Russians took steps to make sure that the East Germans didn't get out of hand. For example, the fact that they sent General Konyev, uh, who had been one of the generals that had captured Berlin in 1945, sent him to sent him to Berlin when the wall went up just to make sure that Air Conacher didn't get out of hand. Uh, and that was one of the senses that General Clay had when he was there as the president's personal representative, that he had a, he had a sense that he could push the Russians pretty far, but he also knew when to not push him too far. And that uh, the problem was, is that back in Washington, uh, the Kennedy administration, a lot of folks didn't have nearly as much experience dealing with the Russians as Clay did. And so they were concerned that Clay was being too provocative. But Clay had a good sense that if you press the Russians just up to the right point, in other words, you didn't oversell your case, but if you were only asserting rights that the Russians already knew that you had, they would live with that. And I, the big set, the big takeaway I got from that is that the Russians didn't want a war either. They didn't want a cataclysm, hmm. uh, at least not in Berlin. And so this, and this was, and Steinsuchen was an example where you, you have this impossible situation when you think about it. I mean, it's almost a joke. When you think about it, you've got this one neighborhood that is controlled by one power, but the, the, the power that's responsible for protecting it can't even drive there. Yet for 20 years, they yeah. managed to keep yeah. the uh, this situation from not getting out of hand. And that was a testament to both the Americans and the Russians. Absolutely. So when when the Berlin Wall opens, what happens to Steinstucken? Uh by then, Steinstucken was, was really being treated as part of a neighborhood of West Berlin. So uh, the, the road to Steinstucken was open in August of 71. The wall didn't, oh, the Berlin Wall didn't open until 18 years later, 1989. And so by then, Steinstucken had pretty well been integrated into uh, West Berlin. It was really pretty much like a West Berlin neighborhood. So it's... Uh, its experience when the wall came down was was unique because it was so completely surrounded by the Berlin Wall. Many Berlin neighborhoods, the Berlin Wall was nowhere near them. For, for Steinstuckeners, the Berlin Wall was in the backyard. So if they wanted to go chip a section out of the Berlin Wall, they could do that. If they want, they could just go out the backyard, the back door, and do it. Uh, if they wanted to go into East Germany, they could do that. It was just literally across the street. I don't know much about exactly what the outskirts were like around West Berlin, but the town of Babelsberg butted right up next to Steinstück and it literally was on the other side of the street from it. And so when the wall opened up, Steinstückeners were able to visit with um, people that they had not seen for over 25 years. And uh, so imagine if you lived in a neighborhood and all of a sudden, the wall was put around your neighborhood. The, the people across the street that you had known for decades, all of a sudden, you can't see them. Well, but but you knew them. They were part of your part of your extended circle. Uh, maybe they were part of your family. And then when the wall came down, you could literally cross the street and see those people again. Uh, there's one story when they the Americans landed a helicopter in Steinstück and, and the air crew got out. And they noticed that there was, and, the, and a lot of the air crewmen knew the people in Steinstucken because of the close relationship between the Berlin Brigade Aviation Detachment and the Steinstucken villagers, which we discuss in the book. And so the Americans knew some of a lot of the Steinstuckeners, but then there were some folks standing there that they didn't recognize. And they're like, who are these people? And the villagers said, these are our neighbors from across the street, literally. They were East Germans. And they got a chance to sit in the helicopter and they got a chance to tell stories about how they'd watch the helicopters coming in and out of Steinstück. And uh, even after the road was built, the Berlin Brigade Aviation Detachment made a point of flying out to Steinstück just to continue asserting the authority of the Americans to fly within the Berlin control zone. Because even though Steinstück itself is out there in East German territory, it's within the Berlin control zone. So I think the, the helicopters, they didn't land, but they flew out there pretty much every day. So uh, they had a good relationship with the villagers. And what, one of the big things the Steinstuckeners had is that they had uh, a lot more wall to take down. So I'm sure they had I'm sure they had all sorts of chunks of wall to give to people because they were surrounded by it. What comes across in the book is that strong bond between 
the population of Steinstucken and the U.S. forces that was formed. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book is I don't want that to be forgotten. That's why I made a, a point of putting two specific pictures in the book. One is of the Rotor Blade Memorial. And that is a memorial uh, where the blades were, de- were, or were donated by Bell Helicopter Company, the company that makes the Huey helicopters that were used for the most part in the, in the helicopter airlift. And those two blades stand in Steinstucken now. And hardly anybody knows that they're there. Hardly anybody visits them because they just don't know. They're in the middle of a little village. There's no signs really bringing you to them. Certainly no signs on the Autobahn saying, hey, American Memorial this way. And now it's just the Steinstucken residents that are keeping that up because the Americans are long gone from Berlin. So I'm hopeful that that will raise some awareness of this memorial so we might get some more civic support for keeping that memorial up. Right now, it looks like the Berlin government's doing a good job of keeping the memorial up. But, you know, the more people that care about the memorial, um, the longer it will last. And right next to the memorial is a is a, a, ch- a children's place that we'll, place that we'd call a jungle gym that kids climb on, and it's in the shape of a helicopter with a helicopter blade. And it was made by the Berlin Brigade during the helicopter airlift. And so you see some pictures of kids getting candy that are thrown thrown off of the the, the helicopter place. And the place it's still there. The Steinstucken residents have just refurbished it, so kids are playing on it now, and. Uh, yeah, that's something that was really special, and, and I hope it doesn't get lost, blown over by the sands of time. So hopefully my book will help push back on those sands a little bit and help people remember something that deserves to be remembered. I think your book absolutely will do that, Don. The book is called Steinstucken, A Little Pocket of Freedom. We've only scratched the surface of what's in there. There's loads more detail, some amazing photos as well. I really recommend that uh, you, if you're interested in the Cold War and or Cold War Berlin, then this is a great little known story of the Cold War, I would say. And I really enjoyed it. And do check out the links in the episode description to Don's website and also links as to how to buy the book and support the podcast. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.